Thank you, Gloria. Uh, thank you, Father, for your introductory remarks. Um, my name is Arthur Brooks. I'm president of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, many of you know our institution. We're dedicated to the cause of free enterprise for all people here in the United States and around the world. I'm going to be talking to you today about something that I think is integral to free enterprise, which is what's going on in our philanthropic economy. It's part of a broader project that we have going on in American philanthropic freedom. For those of you who are interested, we have a much bigger more extensive event on my comments on the 3rd of December at ADI at noon. So, and we have representatives from ADI here to, to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> for years, I was a professor at Syracuse University. My main area of study was the economics of philanthropy. So I'm, I'm kind of going back to uh, my not very humble roots. They feel more humble now, I have to say. Um, I was a professor for a long time, and I think it's just noticeable that nobody took the front rows, which is just <laughs> like it was in my classes. <laughs> um, there, in the, the philanthropic economy, the reason this is an interesting subject for a lot of you today is that there's been a ton of policy change over the past five years. There's been a lot of policy uncertainty. There has been cultural change around economic policy, and there have been a lot of misconceptions about how this is going to affect the philanthropic economy. Most of the arguments that I hear about the subject we're here to talk about today, about philanthropy and the reaction to public policy, is driven by two things, two not very good things. One is protecting special interests. Um, you know, and, does, and you fill in the blanks. It's we want to protect our industry, and so therefore we're ideologically opposed to any change in policy. The other is ideology per se, either on the left or the right. It's actually important to distinguish facts from opinions, and that's what I'm going to try to do here right now based on the best data available, which I submit to you for your consideration. I have three questions to answer in the next six, five or six minutes. How has giving changed due to the recession? What, can the, what is the result of the tax increases that we saw in January? And what can we expect from the proposed deductions cap in the president's budget? I have actual numbers to show you from this, to tell you about uh, from, from my own research. Now, the data that I'm using are the best data available. They're from the University of Michigan's Panel Study of Income Dynamics. 8,500 families have been tracked since the late 1960s and an extensive battery of questions about giving behavior much more accurate than any other data set that's out there right now. Uh, they're hard to work with, but worthwhile. Uh, the concepts that I want to remind you of, most of you know about this because you're pretty sophisticated in philanthropy. The first is that there are big income effects on philanthropy. Simply put, when people make more money, they give more away. The question is, when they make more money, how much more do they give away? And how has that changed? The second is tax effects. Now, the key thing that a lot of people, you're not civilians, you're philanthropy insiders, but civilians don't understand is that when you raise taxes, that lowers the price of giving. That's the tax price of giving. Why? Because people who deduct uh, uh, charitable, uh, take the charitable deduction, of course, they see a lower price of giving because their deduction gets higher. What that tells us basically is the price of giving falls when taxes rise. And that means that when taxes rise at the margin, in the first year at least, you're going to see more charitable giving, not less. Now, this is really paradoxical, but it's something that every economist who studies this is completely comfortable with. Um, I've never met an economist who denies this. Um, when taxes go up at the margin, charitable giving goes up at the margin. That doesn't make it good, in my view, that makes that not good at all, in my view. Taxes shouldn't go up for anybody, ever. But, uh, <laughs> but that said, I'm going to give you the results, not, notwithstanding that fact of what we've seen in policy. OK, now a couple of weird things that come out of the data so far. The income effects that we typically see are much more muted than traditionally is the case. Typically, when incomes in America go up by 10%, you see charitable giving going up by 10%. Today, when, giving goes, when incomes go up by 10%, you see about a 6.3% increase in charitable giving. Conversely, when incomes go down by 10%, you see only a decrease of about 6.3%. Now, the reason for that largely is that people are resistant to not giving, particularly religious people, to houses of worship, even when their incomes decrease. And so in a recession like this, you will see people uh, reacting less, uh, less strongly than they would be during a big expansion. So that's not too surprising. The tax effect is a little bit more interesting. What we find is a massive tax effect. 
uh, people are much more volatilely reacting to changes in the tax system. And the reason for that is because of the incredible uncertainty around this administration's approaches to approach to regulation and taxes. Nobody knows what's going to happen and they can't make their plans. And typically any industry sees more volatility when they don't know what to expect. Okay, so what do these things mean for us today? Well, in January, of course, we saw a, a price change in charitable giving. You saw the top marginal tax rate go from 35% to 39.6% for families making over $450,000 a year. Now, that's a big part of the donor base, as most of you know. Not for every organization, but for, for a lot of them. That means the average price of giving $10 went from $6.50 to, to $6.04, effectively. The price of giving went down. How much did giving go up? Well, nationwide, according to the best estimates, that increase in marginal taxes will probably result in an increase in charitable giving of 1.13% nationwide. That's what we can expect as a result of those tax increases. Again, this is no editorial about the, about the benefits of tax increases. On the contrary, this will lead to muted economic growth and it will have deleterious impacts on the charitable economy going forward. But in the first year, this is what we can expect. Okay, now, the second uh, policy and arguably the more interesting one is the charitable deduction cap. It's contemplated by a lot of people around Washington, D.C., including the president himself, that it would be a good policy to take the charitable deduction cap down to 28%. Everybody who has a marginal tax rate of 28% and above is going to be affected by this. Okay. What will it do? It will raise the price of giving. It will raise the price of giving for people who are at 39.6%, who have their charitable deductions capped at 28%. That effectively raises the price of giving a dollar by over 19%. That's going to have a big impact. What is the impact going to be? For the whole charitable economy in the coming year, if we were to do that, you could expect $9.4 billion in less charitable giving. For all charitable giving, we would see a, a decrement of about 4.35% at the individual level, immediately, a bite taken out at that level. Secular giving, minus 7%. Religious giving, about minus 1%, because again, it's more resistant to these types of phenomena because of the path dependency of religious givers. Only people who itemize, over 9%. And here's where it gets interesting. If you look at the top 1%, the much maligned 1%, well, guess what? Itemizers in the top 1% of the population, they give 20% of all American philanthropy. We need them if we like our causes. If you only look at the top percent of earners who itemize, uh, they will be giving 24% less under the current, uh, under a 28% cap. Now, some of you are involved in organizations that have 1% donor bases. Are you a university? Are you a museum? Are you an environmental nonprofit? Are you a, a, an elite hospital? You have a 1% donor base. You can expect up to a quarter of your donations to go away as a result of the 28% giving cap. Okay, now, that might scare you. Um, if it doesn't, it means it should, and you're not listening. Okay. Um, <laughs> So what do we know? The tax, uh, the, the tax policy changes that have been made to date will be a small net positive. Um, this does not take into account negative impacts dynamically on economic growth, and the contemplated future limits on deductions will have an, a, a really pretty enormous effect, especially for certain nonprofits um, that many of you represent. Um, how would charities make up for these losses? Almost certainly a lot of them would be lobbying for government support. We would see systemic impacts. Um, now, before I close, I'm going to urge one more thing to you. I want you uh, who are involved in nonprofit advocacy to consider the following. And these are real caveats to it. Number one, any policies that distort market incentives always affect growth negatively and some negative impact on giving in the long run. Um, it, n it never ceases to amaze me the nonprofit executives who actually like high marginal tax rates because they want rich people to continue to try to avoid those taxes by giving to their nonprofit organizations. That's an absolute abridgment of freedom, and I, I, I would urge you to join me in regretting that ideology. The second point is that these policies, uh, typically, that actually are, are trying to keep the deduction high or trying to raise taxes or whatever, because of some of the, the, the cautions that I've given you today, put free marketeers in a very awkward position, pitting industry interests against personal principles. Um, that probably has more meaning for some of you than it does for others, but I'll, I'll, I'll simply let that gestate and look forward to turning it over to my friend Gene Sterling.
Thank you. Is this microphone on? Can you hear me? Can't tell because of the sunlight whether the lights on. <laughs> Uh, my name is Gene Sterley, and one of my jobs at the Urban Institute is to head up something called a Tax Policy and Charities Project. My background is in, in public finance budget. I work on a lot of budget, Social Security, and other issues. I helped found a Tax Policy Center and helped found a Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy at the Urban Institute. And for those who are interested, please let me know afterwards. Be glad to put you on the emails for any of these, uh, any of the, any of this output. The purpose of the Tax Policy and Charities Project is to, is to provide a neutral forum to actually to discuss the various impacts of the uh, of things like the charitable deduction or changes to the charitable deduction, uh, but beyond the charitable deduction, property tax deduction, uh, a whole bunch of other issues to really provide a neutral forum to provide, to provide a, uh, a solid base of information by which people proceed. And one of the people who actually did a paper for us was we even got the president of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, one Arthur Brooks, you might know him, who actually did a nice paper for us. So we have people from all over the uh, all over the spectrum, some ideological, some neutral, most of them just basically doing good, solid, solid research. Uh, and our purpose, as I say, is to, is to inform these fiscal debates in a, in a fairly neutral manner. So in the remainder of my talk, I, I, I want to make basically three basic points. Uh, and they, they, they can get confused, and you know, there's always this issue of language and how you interpret language. I'm, I'm actually reminded a bit of uh, of language in some church and synagogue bulletins. You might have seen some of them. You know, for instance, one bulletin said, you know, please put your contribution in the collection basket along with the person you want remembered. <laughs> <laughs> and another, another one said uh, that uh, Margaret McGillicuddy will be singing, I will not pass this way again, much to the delight of the congregation. <laughs> And one of my favorites was that uh, the children will be performing Hamlet in the basement uh, tonight. Please come early and watch this tragedy unfold. <laughs> so sometimes words can, words, words can be misinterpreted. And so the three things that I, I want to emphasize here is the extraordinary uh, power uh, and uh, dynamism of the American charitable sector relative to almost any country in the world. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how that affects uh, government interaction with the charitable sector because sort of once you're big and powerful and influential, you're going to have a lot of interactions with everybody, whether government or households or anything else, and, and you need to come to expect that. And then I, I finally want to uh, emphasize something that I, I did a lot in a, in a very successful testimony I had earlier this year where I went for the Ways and Means Committee and I basically argued that this debate over the charitable deduction is just not proceeding in the right way. It's, it's basically sort of a thumbs up or thumbs down debate. We're sort of having a similar, because of our, our huge problems in, in coming to any compromises as a society, we started having the same with Social Security. You're for it, you're against it, you're for Obamacare, you're against it. And people who really want to make each of these sectors better, who want to strengthen the charitable sector and strengthen the government sector at the same time, which I think most of us do, uh, are sort of put at an impasse. So those are the three things that, that, I, that I want to emphasize very quickly. So the first one I said is I just want to talk about the, the power and the dynamism of the charitable sector in the U.S. economy. People in the United States give about 2% of their income to charity. That's higher as best we can tell than almost any nation in the world. Uh, there are uh, large nonprofit sectors in other economies, but if you look closely, for instance, at most economies in Western Europe, uh, these nonprofit sectors are largely financed by the government. And so they're really an arm of the government, which is not necessarily bad. You know, certainly hospitals and higher educational institutions, one could argue, do a lot of things for our government in the United States, that a huge amount of our funding for these institutions comes from government. But in these other societies, it, it, do, it doesn't create the dynamism, that dynamism that you see in people, that people like to talk to have talked about. Uh, for ages, you know, the extraordinary extent to which Americans get together, collaborate, uh, create everything from, you know, religious organizations to music societies, which was to talk about and emphasize, and the extent to which that really creates, if you want to, an information system. It's not, it's not just the activities these people engage in, but it's, it's the way it gives us information on what to do. The talk will emphasize, you know, that in, in Europe, it was largely aristocracies that led the way and people had to follow. And so the charitable sector is just playing just, just this, this, this wonderful role in the United States. But one consequence, as I say, is that once you're large and you're successful, then, you know, you create problems. You create some envy problems. Somebody might look at some successful part of the sector and, and not like its resources or might think that they could better allocate these resources. So you, you really need to come to expect this. The more successful you are, 
the more that people are going to want to interact with you. And that goes to uh, the charitable sector's relationship to government. There's a uh, debate in the, in the literature over what this relationship is. And part of this debate says, well, let's think about the uh, government and nonprofit sector uh, as supplements. That is, the nonprofit sector is mainly a supplement to government. This has especially arisen in the last 30 or 40 years as the government social welfare function has grown quite extensively. And so there's this notion, as in the case of, say, paying Medicare payments to hospitals or paying Pell Grants to higher education, well, the, the nonprofit sector is there just to supplement what government already wants to do. But in point of fact, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, to complement it, uh, the other, but there's another view that actually the, the nonprofit sector supplements what the government does. That is, you engage in activities the government just won't do it. It may just be because a majority doesn't want to do it, and you've got people within the charitable sector who really have the ideas and the instigation to do stuff. And then finally, there's, there's a necessary and a fruitful, if done correctly, adversarial role. You stir and push the government to do things, but by the same token, the government at times is going to stir and push you to do, uh, to do things as well. And that, that can be and should be a healthy relationship. But it's this power, this ability of the nonprofit and the charitable sector to do all these things is part of, part of its, its, uh, its, 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 its great, great strength. So I want to give you a couple numbers here to, to think about the charitable deduction in, in this world. The government's social welfare function is now about 20% of GDP. That's really in excess of $3 trillion. So government at all levels is spending about $3 trillion on social welfare functions. So what is the charitable deduction cost? $40 billion, $50 billion a year? Mm -hmm. uh, something along those lines. So it's only about 2%, if you want to, of this social welfare function. So this argument that the government needs to reduce this subsidy uh, because uh, it might not be well spent or they could better allocate the money, they're already allocating most of the money. And they're also, by the way, also allocating most of the money directly to the charitable sector by direct grants. So the direct grants from government are far larger in size than is the, uh, the subsidy they give to the charitable deduction. So why have a charitable deduction? Well, in part it's because it's an alternative way of getting information on what to do as a society. With the charitable deduction, we give individuals the decision making over how to allocate the subsidy, as opposed to sending that decision making to our government officials. I'm not arguing one is better than the other, I'm just arguing you probably want to have both. You want some decisions to be made through a democratic process, majority rule, or representatives, but you want other subsidies where you really want to find out from individuals where they want to allocate money. And I think that's one of the great values of the charitable deduction. And in this line, I think Arthur may have mentioned it, there's this question, legitimate debate in, in tax policy as to, well, who gets the benefit of the deduction? Is it the contributor or the donor, or is it the donee? And I think most of us here would say, well, it's the donee who's getting the benefit. So when you're talking about cutting back on the charitable deduction, you're mainly talking about cutting back on the benefits to the donees because a lot of donors could just simply reduce their contributions and not, not be impacted at all. So my final comment is given this mix, given this interaction with government, given this mix of grant making and, and, and subsidies through charitable contributions, it seems to me that the debate should be centering on how can we strengthen both sectors. So let's be fair about this. The president's proposal, which really was not aimed at the charitable sector, was aimed to be like a sequestered across the board cut in all itemized deductions. It's trying to address a legitimate issue, which is the extraordinary problem we've got in our budget. Extraordinary extent to which, by the way, it's impacting a lot of charities. It's cutting back, our current budget's cutting back on spending on children, on social welfare functions across the board. We've got a lot of problems. Uh, so we should be trying to strengthen the government's ability to deal with social problems. But at the same time, we should be trying to strengthen the charitable sector. And I've suggested in testimony in a lot of other places, I think there are a lot of ways to do it. I've suggested, for instance, allowing giving to April 15th, because I think that would influence a lot of people to give a tax filing time. I've suggested that one could add a non-itemizer deduction and pay for it by cutting back on some deductions that really don't, we believe, provide that much of an incentive. This is the type of discussion I think that we should be having. How do we strengthen both sectors at the same time? And I really encourage you, to the extent you're going and seeing your member of Congress, is to say to them, we recognize there's a problem here in the budget, whatever else it is, but let's try to solve it by strengthening the charitable sector and strengthening the government sector at the same time. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Robert Sharp, and I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon and welcome the opportunity to share with you some uh, of the perspective regarding the topic of today from the perspective of 
individual donors and how they're impacted. A lot of the work that I do is with institutions helping them plan and implement their programs designed to encourage private funding, uh, mostly from individuals, some from corporate foundation, but mostly uh, from individual sources. So what I want to do is take a look at this issue for a few minutes from the perspective of how a donor looks at this from, from their standpoint. When they look out and they see all the things they can support, they see that there's sharing reductions available, uh, they bake all this into their decisions, and they support uh, multiple charities in many cases uh, to, to the extent that they feel they're able. So I start with the idea that every dollar that any person in this room earns, you start with the idea that you have to pay some of it in taxes. All right? What's left from your dollar after paying taxes, you either spend it on your own needs, you save it, contribute it to retirement plans for the future, or you give it away. You may give it to family members, pay someone's tuitions, or you may give it to, to charities. So every dollar is carved up from those four uses. All right, picking up on what Arthur said on the impact of, of increased taxes, just starting with taking another 5%, let's say, from the dollar from, in taxes, that right there you have five cents left per dollar to allocate to those other sources. For whether or not there's a charitable reduction, the five cents has to come from spending, saving, or giving. So you have a decision to make there. Now under our current system, we don't, we don't tax charitable gifts, money that's voluntarily redistributed. Now what is the impact of that? If I want to give $1,000 and there's no tax code, it costs me $1,000 to do that. That's how much money has to come out of my earnings. If on the other hand, you have a, a, an income tax code and your tax rate's 25, 30, 35, 40%, uh, and that's deductible, and you don't have to pay tax on that money, then how much money does it take you to make that $1,000 gift? It still takes $1,000. Now, from the standpoint of the, of the individual, if all of a sudden, the charitable deduction disappears in whole or in part, now you've got a different story. Now, you, if you're in the 25% tax bracket, which starts at $37,000 for an individual, for example, you now have to earn $1,333 in order to have $1,000 after tax. So that's a 33% increase in the cost of that, of that gift. If you're in a 40% bracket, you have to earn $1,666 pre-tax if it's not deductible, all right? So that's just, a, now that money has to come, that extra, those extra dollars have to come from somewhere. They have to come from spending, from saving. People have to reduce some consumption or saving, or they have to reduce what they're giving to their family if they're gonna to continue to make that charge of good. So, you could argue then that a rational actor, as I think Jean just mentioned, might just lower their, their giving to where it still cost them $1,000. Well, if you're in a 25% bracket, you would lower your gift from $1,000 to $750. If you're in or a 25% reduction in giving. If you're in a 40% bracket, you'd have to lower your gift to $600 rather than 1,000 to keep your outlay of your, from your cash flow uh, the same. So there's a carrot incentive, if you will, in the charitable deduction, but We've had this deduction, as Gloria said, for nearly 100 years, and people have baked this into their thinking. So to all of a sudden reduce that or eliminate it, you change the economics of the situation, and you vastly increase the cost of, of the giving. Now, if you believe in the concept of elasticity of demand, uh, and that certain things, the demand is more inelastic than others, uh, gasoline, utilities, uh, health, health premiums, whatever it is, there's some things that you're going to pay even if they go up in cost. There are other things maybe not. If movie tickets are $3, you might go to see a lot of movies. If they're $35, you're going to pick and choose which movies. You're probably going to lower your demand for that. So as people look at the increased cost of giving by eliminating the charitable deduction or reducing it, capping it, however you want to, you want to approach it, I don't think they look at it from a pure, rational standpoint. They're not going to, if they say, I'm going to reduce my giving by 20%. Well, they don't reduce a $10 gift to $8, and they don't reduce a, a dollar to 80 cents. 
They don't reduce 10,000 to 8,000. I think they take a look at, their, at the relative involvement they have with different charities and their demand for giving to those charities in some cases is more elastic or in, in some cases are more inelastic, which gets to the point that if someone is involved personally or emotionally, spiritually, however, with a particular charity, and it's time to make their, their annual commitment to their church or synagogue or whatever their religious belief, uh, they're going to think a while before they tell the person who solicited them that they can't do that, or the person calls from the annual fund for their college. Yeah, I can do that. So it may very well be that some, in some cases, the, the inelasticity of the demand for that particular gift keeps that gift steady, and they, may, they take out the 20%, the 2,000 out of 10,000, all comes out of other less personal involved charities, if you will. If you think of a pyramid, if you reduce the charitable giving, people are not necessarily going to just cut one side off the pyramid and reduce everything equally. There's going to be gradations and changes that affect different charities in different ways. I was on the plane the other day with the CEO of a local uh, nonprofit that gets federal money, but it also gets a lot of private money. And what they do is they take at-risk children early in life and they try to divert them into leadership paths. Very important thing in the community. And he was, he was asking what I was doing, and, and I, I explained to him, he said, well, you know, you need to make the point that charities like ours, who are relatively new in people's lives, and we don't have the level of longevity of giving and commitment that others do, I'm afraid that we will be impacted disproportionately if you raise the cost of giving and make people have to make these decisions. Now, from an economic standpoint, just to, just to underscore some of what, uh, of what Arthur and Jean were saying, the nonprofit sector employs five times the number of people in the auto industry. And we all know what, what Congress did when it came time to take a, a, a look at preserving that element of the economy. Well, if you cut, if itemizers cut their charitable giving, just the itemizers, by 20%, that's $34 billion. At $50,000 a job, that's 680,000 jobs. Charities are not going to not pay their rent or their phone bills or whatever. This is going to mean jobs and 680,000 jobs is approximately 1% more on the unemployment rate. And if those jobs come disproportionately from smaller community-based organizations that are impacting the social service sector in many ways that, that would be government. If not, I think we need to contemplate not only the macro uh, impact of this, but what you find if you do this, it's not going to have an across-the-board uh, impact. It's probably going to have a selective impact, which is admittedly speculative, but I think we need to think a while, uh, given the fact that experts giving institute, others have said giving USA, it may be 2017 before we get back to the giving levels of 2007. So now may not be a time to, to be uh, experimenting with uh, the cost of giving.